This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. This is a conversation with the magnificent Ishan from Emperor. This is the first of two, as a matter of fact. The conversation was recorded on February 27, 2018, and the compelling event is the release of the solo album titled Armour. This is also the first time this chat has been broadcast on YouTube. It has been available via the podcast apps for a few years now. This is one of the most in-depth conversations with Ishan about his talent as a songwriter. Throughout the conversation, he shares his thoughts on his connection, his musical connection with Devon Townsend, why he still refers to the music that he makes to this day as black metal, He answers my question if he considers himself a spokesperson for the black metal genre. He dives deep on the topic on why black metal is all about, and here's the key word, innovation. We discuss Emperor's involvement in the criminal aspects of Gen 2 black metal's early years and why he's not immune to criticism. So here he is, Ishan from Emperor. Enjoy. So, Ishan, welcome to the show. You know, I must say that I've really enjoyed your evolution as an artist and a musician. So, most people will be aware of your contributions to black metal as the frontman and emperor, of course. But significantly, you are now seven albums into your solo career. So, what can you tell us about the new album? And I've, I hopefully will pronounce it correctly. Is it Amar or Amir? Yeah, Amr. Amr. There you go. I was close. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, no, it's um, what can I say about the new album? It's um, at at this point. I mean, with these many albums in, it's uh, it's a different interpretation of of uh, where I'm at musically. The, uh, you know, the, and um, I I like to I like to kind of flesh out. There are a lot of ideas as, as a framework for every album I, I start making before I actually start writing anything. And as a comparison to mm. you know my previous album, Arctis, which obviously was very much, you know, the scenery was outside. Yep. You know, so, so, so the scene of that is kind of, you know, in this Arctic landscape. This new album, uh, it's, uh, as the cover suggests, and I think also the production suggests, is, and the lyrics, you know, it's, it's all very much happening inside. Okay. It's a, it's very a very closed off. So I know this is very abstract, and in in um, I would say that it it kind of follows the similar ideas of uh, uh, as I did on Arctis, where I wanted to explore more traditional, you know, pop rock songwriting. Yeah, I could definitely feel <laughs> that. Yeah, for sure. And 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 I wanted to continue that on this album as well. But I, I, instead of kind of going with the typical uh, arrangement of that, um, I, I wanted to make some some other decisions, you know, early on. And I previously leaned on doing a lot of, you know, using a lot of orchestral samples that goes hmm. way back to my my beginnings in Emperor. But uh, very much inspired by film soundtracks and, and the likes. But also at the same time, you know, this fascination for. You know the eerie sounds of uh, of analog synthesis and mm. and John Carpenter and, and that kind of stuff. So so uh-huh. I, I wanted to not limit myself to, but kind of have a, a special focus to to rather go with analog synthesis and, and uh, do more yeah, synthesizer based. Uh, and I, I have different inspirations for it, but like. I had this fascination with some music where they do like mono drums, you know. So, mm. so we recorded we recorded the whole album, you know, with with these analog synthesizers in mind. You know, we recorded the whole album on a an acrylic drum kit, really down tune, and with all stacked cymbals. So you have nearly no ringing sing- cymbals at all. So it's like all the very tight very percussive tight, sounds. Yeah. 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 So, so um, there were some general ideas, and I think. Linus uh, Corneliuson, who mixed the album at Fascination Street, mm. uh, I think still he he could easily have mixed the album as you know a more typical polished 
you know, extreme metal production. Hmm. Uh, but but uh, he was uh, very, very cooperative and, and great in kind of helping in channeling that original vision, you know. To, yes. So it's it's more of a risk, uh, you know, but it's, it just makes the whole process more interesting if you, if you kind of uh, go with the... Uh, uh, with, a, with a whole idea. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a good point. And yeah, I know exactly what you're saying when you say it's a bit of a risk because I imagine to, you know, the dyed in the wool black t shirt wearing Emperor fan, some of this music's going to be very, can I use the word confronting to them? Yeah, I, I, I don't know really. I mean, uh, at, at this point, I mean, I, I try to remind myself. I mean, I, I, I get this a lot, you know, the, oh, what do you think, you know, the Emperor fans would think of your new mm. music? And I, and honestly, and this is not re- disrespectful, but I, I don't. I don't think about it. Good, yeah. Because, mm. uh, and, and I think uh, if people are critical to, to you know, developing and, and, you know, doing new ideas and everything, uh, I think they tend to forget, especially, you know, the purists of, you know, all early yeah. black people. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they need to remember that the reason that that music was created and came about and the reason we as teenagers, you know, kind of ended up doing that type of music at the time where this was no career. I mean, in 1991, starting a black metal band you know, was the worst career choice ever, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so we approached this, you know, for purely artistical reasons. And yeah. I think as a, against all odds, you know, that made it as exclusive and as kind of exotic, you know, coming from Norway. We didn't try to go to London and make it, you know. We didn't go to LA to find a producer to, to make it. You know, we, we've always more or less... You know, stayed in a telemark Norway state of mind. Yes. You know, and that, and I think I, I, I like looking back. I think that is the reason it became, you know, a thing of its own because it was never intended as, you know, something for mass appeal. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, so it's kind of a paradox that it actually ended up being the way I make my living. Yeah. You know, and and I, I and I and I feel so privileged to to have you know, my passion for music be my my livelihood, but also being able to do so in a, such an uncompromising way. Because I know a lot of musicians who love playing music, but who have to play with any style of music and, and do a lot of, of the stuff that, you know, maybe are not that close to their hearts, but, you know, to just to make a living. Mm-hmm. And I've been so privileged to be uncompromisingly do whatever the hell I wanted, you know, throughout my career. And and I, so I think why why change that you know that recipe now? Hmm. And I think uh, it's of course a very selfish thing to do because I'm I'm very privileged to have people actually you know picking up the albums and that you know it's there's a synergy I, in that whole thing. But at the same time, with my background, I feel it's kind of the most honest thing hmm, for sure. to do as well. And I, I I at least I've tried to communicate that you know, true interviews and the way I do my music that at least maybe, maybe I do an album that may b- not be your cup of tea and doesn't resonate with you as a fan. Hmm. But but uh, I t- hope that people who have followed my music for a while at least trust that it's something really genuine and it's made very, you know, 100% hard. Yeah, it's authentic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, it's authentic and I, I try to, that's why I change these scenarios for myself because I want to that's why, you know, this time I wanted to use all these analog synthesizers and explore that kind of soundscape. I've even, you know, picked up uh, influences from dark R&B and hip hop stuff. And I've used 808s, cool. yeah. you know, and, and all that in, in my music because I, it, it, this is something that excites me, you know. And I've, it's a simple philosophy that I, I think if I'm not super excited about, you know, making the music, I can't expect anyone to be excited about listening to it. You know, it's a, it's a communication mm. of, of energy. So, which of course helps me, you know, it's a good argument for me to just keep on doing my selfish thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think a lot of people want you to keep doing, as you say, your selfish thing, because you are, a, you, you do produce extraordinarily complex yet memorable music. So let me ask you this question here. Well, thank you. 
I'm a big <laughs> fan of funk and disco. Okay, so I'm going to out myself now. I'm not not really a metalhead to be honest with you. I'm more into funk, disco, and jazz. Now, of course, funk mm-hmm. and disco, both of those styles of music have very strong jazz roots, which is something that I can hear in your music, and I've actually always heard it. Now, I'm alone in this, but what I'd like to ask you is that from the cadence of the drumming across quite a lot of the cuts on Armour through to the solo, for example, in Arcana in Perry, what role has jazz mm-hmm. played in your evolution as an artist? Well, uh, I wish I could say I... I, I uh has studied jazz or anything like that, but it, it's it's just as a fan of you know some eccentric music, you know, mm. like Miles Davis, uh, you know, sketches of Spain or kind of blue, mm. you know, small stuff like that. My the, the reason I ended up using saxophone in the first place was uh, was for listening to uh, Jan Garbarek, Norwegian saxophone player, if you know him, and uh, it's just small bits and pieces like that. Hmm. It's like I, I, I've often often referred to as kind of falling into the prog category as well. Yes. And uh, and like people are like, oh, what, what kind of prog bands are you into? And you would ask me, you know, that, that because a lot of the prog bands, you know, the members are like living encyclopedias of uh, of 70s prog and who was who in which bands and everything. And hmm. I'm like, sorry, you know. Prog. It's. I, I've never <laughs> tried to be prog or anything. I, I. It's more just a result of me, you know, experimenting with the few things I know. Yes. So 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 um, so I. I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't have a jazz background. I, I have no no. Um, but you're an appreciator product. though, and I can tell that. I can tell that it's music that yeah, you yeah. listen to, and you go, okay, I understand what they're trying to achieve here. Let me see how that works in my music. Yeah, and it's it, it's just like small things like on the, on the Sermbrich, I explored some synthetic scales, you know, to to give some new kind of musical color. Uh, so so it, all these things fascinate me, but it's just me me kind of approaching different, you know, uh, these sounds mm-hmm. and uh, from from jazz music. Like uh, I've used uh, kind of in, let myself influence. Like on Eremita, I was influenced by. To some of these jazz arrangements I heard with these like really short percussive but deep deep brass sections hmm. like these brass stabs stuff like that and uh, yeah, I mean I'm at the edge now age now that I just differentiate between two genres of music and that is you know the stuff that doesn't do anything for me which mm-hmm. I'm neutral to the <laughs> I don't and the stuff that you know Moves gets you. me excited yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so on that note Another thing I noticed was that on the vocal to Where You Are Lost and I Belong, it reminds me a lot of Dave Garn from Depeche Mode. So I know, I don't think anybody's really heard the album in the public sense, but have journalists been giving you feedback that they can hear that through that track? Uh, well, I think uh, you're the second journalist or third journalist I speak to who actually heard the album. So, uh-huh. radio. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't really had that much feedback yet. And especially okay. not on that song. So, but thank you. Well, that's I'll what take I that hear. As a oh, it's definitely a compliment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I love about you. Is uh, when I talk about, you know, when I'm discussing the evolution of yourself as an artist, it seems like there's nothing off limits. You know, as I say, you know, there's the, you got emperors in your past, and I understand that emperor still performs from time to time to this day. But really, you're an evolving artist. So I'm almost excited to see where you go in say five to ten years' time. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that's the thing. That, that's the thing. That's probably why I, you know, end up releasing albums like almost every second year, because mm. that's that's kind of what keeps me going. You know, I I I love studio work. I love spending time in my studio and just, uh, you know, write music and and have these concepts that I I, and and it's always a, a quest for. I mean, th- that's why I refer still refer to my music as black metal because. From the, uh-huh. my very beginning, you know that that's that core uh, inspiration, that that kind of drive and need to do this, you know, it's a, like I, I of course it's uh, uh, I've been super you know privileged to be able to do this, but at the same time it feels like I never really had a choice, you know, yes. it's, it's good just as a driving force, and of course as a music lover, you know, it's 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 this thing inside you that makes you it, it's some kind of abstract ideal and it's kind of in in you as, as kind of a boiling pot and it's far out there 
you know, as as a as a glimpse of an ideal. And every I feel every song and every album is just another attempt of coming closer to that kind of uh, state of mind. You know, that those mm. few milliseconds where where your hands you know the hair on your head you on oh your arms yeah. i'm yeah, a musician just, i understand and you, that yeah. and you just lose yourself you know that that's mm. that's what you go for and and most of the stuff that i'm most happy about you know or, or most satisfied with musically are usually material that i have absolutely no idea how i came up with it mm. but it's like suddenly just my my computer is playing back some music and i have no idea why how i got there but uh, I can kind of get, take credit for it. <laughs> well, you've got a very strong connection to your musical muse. That's what it is. And because you're, you're intellectual, you're a smart bloke, you're able to tap into that and turn... Oh, thank you for saying that, but I don't know. But it, it feels like cheating sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, long, long may you continue to cheat then. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it, it's funny because I, I've spoken to a lot of, of uh, my colleagues and also people that, you know, that I admire. Yep. You know that, and um, a good example like Devin Townsend. T- yes. To me, he's like you know he. It seems you know it's nothing he couldn't do. You know, like uh, he's super talented. He's mm. you know a vocalist, guitar player. You know everything he does. I mean, he was doubling Steve Vai's solos in his band when he was eighteen. You know, it's like <laughs> so, so he's like super skilled. Yes. And and uh, I've I've kind of been given a lot of credit for my work. And I'm like, oh, how long can I get away with this? When will people, you know, catch me red-handed, you know, with all my flaws and, you know, all the stuff I don't know? Right. Okay. And and yeah. I and I spoke to, I spoke to Devin, and he said, you know, he felt exactly the same way, you know, because you you kind of thrown compliments at you, and you just feel like you you kind of been lucky, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> and oh, well. you can kind of take credit for it. But yeah. Well, I've, I've so, had a good chat it, to Devin as well, mate, and you both share something. You're both very humble. A lot of humility here. Yeah, but it's it's not like that. But it's it's it's. Um, yeah, I think it, it, for for me that was kind of comforting to see so someone who I kind of believed was super confident about everything because mm. it was so obvious obvious that they were super talented, and for myself, I just felt you know I was just barely getting away with it and you know to see he, him struggling with the same kind of things and yeah and it, i guess it's for for all people who deal with any kind of art form you know of course what people see is what you actually finish you know they don't see all the crap that you know all the sketches and all the fold up paper oh God, yeah yeah no they wouldn't no a lot a lot of people who listen to music who don't have an understanding of how music is created wouldn't understand the the creative process and how maddening it can be and yeah you're right and how if you don't save something at the right time in your door and whatever you're using reaper or audacity for a lot of the people who do it at home um mm. and or you don't have enough hard drive space halfway through with these bloody new macbook airs sorry with only 120 <laughs> gigabytes of hard drive internally and the thing's trying to back itself up madly into the cloud and it doesn't happen fast enough and you've lost something that you thought was <laughs> approaching genius <laughs> you know hey let me let me go back to something because you mentioned you still classify your music as black metal so i had a good chat to sata last year ahead of the release of their album deep calleth upon deep now my opinion is that both yourself and sata are the pillars of norwegian black metal now what i mean by that is without either of the two of you it would be akin to removing the rudder from a yacht so have you ever felt an obligation as the composer of so much revered black metal to assume the mantle as the spokesperson for the genre not at all uh, and uh, and that is also very deliberate because mm. I, to, to me I, I think there's this uh, uh, misconception that, again about black metal I, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a total paradox uh, that uh, that people have these rules about mm. uh, what black metal should and should not be uh, which is typical for, for all kinds of, uh, of uh, subculture I think that kind of rises to some kind of of uh, commercial level that it's it starts out as a very open you know field because it's there are no borders that are defined hmm. but uh, but then you know a few bands it, it's like you you're, you you play guitar bass play bass oh bass yeah, and bass. guitar but oh. my sage instruments bass yeah yeah okay but, but like Jimi hendrix hmm. you know 
you know, people, ah, oh, Jimi Hendrix, he was the greatest guitar player of, of all time. And uh, so we have to buy his old gear and, and kind of uh, just simulate that, hmm. which is kind of the opposite of what he was doing. I mean, he was plugging his guitar straight into desks via a fuss box. You know, he, he was obviously, the reason he came up with that sound is because he was pushing the envelope of where sound was at hmm. at that stage. So, so, so I think he would be horrified to, to be an inspiration for going backwards. You yes, know? <laughs> understood. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying and, completely on and, that and, point. And, yeah. and, and, and the same thing with, with Norwegian black metal. I mean, this is obviously, you know, the, the do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. You know, that whole satanic uh -huh. imagery thing, you know, that big ego, don't tell us what to do, you know, that whole rock and roll rebellion thing just pushed to another extreme in that decade, hmm. you know. Uh, how could how could you ever put you know, I mean, well to put it simpler, if I as as kind of a front man in in a black metal band, what kind of black metal music would I make with integrity that could kind of resonate that kind of atmosphere and uh, and kind of uh, dark subject if I if I was listening to what you know, okay, what what would my fans want? Maybe someone someone else could tell me how I can do my music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you know what I mean, it's, that's a paradox. I mean, what? what it, yeah, it's. I felt that I I feel it described that very wrongly, but I'm ba basically. No, I understand. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially the Hendrix we, comparison that you made. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah, and and and, and I get this all the time. Oh, will there be another Emperor album? Because hmm, yeah. obviously people are very nostalgic to that, and I, I was thinking. Are, are people actually aware of what they're asking? Because what kind of Emperor album would they like to have? Well, I you think know? they've got one now through your, I mean, with all due respect to Sam, or through your new album. I mean, you were a, a primary architect of the Emperor Sound, so this is really it. It's just under a different name in my view. Am I, am I yeah, on point there? Well, thank, you, thank you for saying that. I mean, you know, again, you know, if, if I did my music, I mean, this is how I, I write metal. You know, in yes. 2018, this is how I write metal. And if it was up to me, you know, it, whether it had the Emperor logo on, or Regent logo, it will, in, in my, you know, ideal world, this is what it would sound like. Mm. But obviously, had we continued Emperor, you know, I would never have, you know, Samus and Trim would probably never agree to do Emperor with eight string guitars and saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> free form you know so 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 to me and no disrespect to them i mean the, it it was a compromise of of who was in especially me and samos you know that yeah. that made emperor what it was but for me uh, you know doing an emperor album now a metal album with emperor would kind of be a limitation to where i want to to kind of absolutely my yeah. music so and and we could easily make an emperor album that sounded some like something like you know the early stuff. We could probably do something that sounded like a mix of Ishan and the Wretched End, which is somewhat the thing. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, w would it would it be anything? You know, would that be genuine? W would anyone or have any band kind of reformed after almost twenty years and actually made an album that was like, yeah, fuck, this is amazing. You know, it, it mm. doesn't happen. So it's it, it, people ask for another Emperor album, but I think it's just really the desire to kind of recreate and relive some kind of nostalgic moments, as both you and me know, with music that we grew up with on as teenagers, that you know are, are attached to so much of our memories, our of feelings, course. and what mm. what we ended up being. And I took my son to see Iron Maiden, and uh, <laughs> you know. Just reliving those moments, listening yeah. to those songs. You know, it's. Um... Yeah. Okay. I think I've got. Have I got time for one more question? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So I hope I frame this next question appropriately. So here I go. Deep breath. So <laughs> I've read a few interviews with you online, and a common theme is for journalists to focus on your past, with of course, which of course means the obligatory reference to Bards and Thomas or Samoth, sorry, respective crimes. So mm -hmm. you, you've long made your thoughts clear on these matters. So I'm definitely not asking about your perspective there, but 
Do you get to a point when you're reading your own copy, so say you're listening to an interview or reading an interview with a journalist and they've turned the story into being, or there is somewhere in the mix of the story, there's a paragraph or a narrative about Bard and Samoth as if their actions from over 20 years ago are somehow specific, specifically relative to your current pre- creative pursuits and do you think, oh God, here we go again? No, not really. I, the, the, that's, um, what, what can I say? I think in the past, you know, especially early emperor, and also I was very concerned when doing interviews. You know, mm. oh, was I misquoted? Oh, oh no, they got the wrong idea. Oh no, they're kind of angling this wrong, and you know, being very concerned like that. But yes. then, I, no, I mean, I can't, I can't remember how. Yeah, I, I've probably done thousands of interviews, and probably said so many stupid things, and been misquoted so many times. Mm. To, you know, probably the opposite of what I've actually said, and it it hasn't really backfired that hard. You know, so, yeah. so so I don't care, and 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 I, it's like with my albums. I mean, you, obviously, you know the the first Emperor albums, and you course, know it's yeah. it, it's it's come to so, uh, such praise. You know, the same magazines that absolutely slaughtered our first albums when they came out are the same magazines who who have put you know those albums side by side with you know. Black Sabbath's first album. Yeah, as, or Iron you know, Maiden's Number of the Beast. So, you see, you see yeah, in the so, Nights so, so, clips up there with that all the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. And and so, so I've kind of been getting so much shit and so much praise for exactly the same music. And I, I've just, you know, in a boring way, I've just had to relate to, okay, that, that it's, it's my own per- perception of whether I succeeded or not, you know, in, in relation to the goals I set for an album. Mm. That's that's the only way I can. Re- of course, I appreciate, you know, when people come with constructive feedback and and you know if it if it resonates with people and and they they feel good about it. But uh, and of course, I'm not immune to criticism. You know, it's uh, it it can be provocative, but as a whole, I mean, the popularity of an album or me or whatever, it's kind of gone. That's like going up and down on the stock market. Mm. And, and and it's like I, I noticed especially I think that's made me, gave me a good perspective because I've I've been playing with Emperor and Isham kind of back to back you know over the years the, yes. over the last few years now yeah. and and sometimes I'll come to this huge festival in Europe and kind of play the maiden stage to 50 or 80,000 people and next year I'll be there with Isham playing maybe the 10 to, <laughs> to 10,000 people you know and, and uh, on the middle of the bill Mm. And 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 one year I'm kind of treated like fucking royalty, and the next year I'm you know I'm I'm there carrying my own guitars and all that stuff, and I I don't mind and and it's all these to me it's it's just a very a very superficial framework because I I kind of know my limitations and I'm know what I'm good for in a, in a way so and when I get on stage I don't I don't honestly I don't care whether it's Ishan or it's Emperor because it, I kind of just go into that bubble it's more of a state of mind it doesn't matter if it's the songs are 20 years old or 2 months old you know when you get in that zone mm-hmm. so so uh, so I just to me it's just been a, f- a rather funny experience to see how kind of these popularities or, or the stages of things just fluctuates hmm. and and it's absolutely nothing I can do about that and kind of going back to your original question about you know with board and 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 Samos and when we did the in the lights of the clips uh, reunions uh, shows with with board yep. on, on on drums you know people are like oh how can you how can you you know take yes. it back in the band and yeah and I was like to, first of all, I mean, we we were friends, and it was 20, 20 years or so something mm-hmm. ago. It was, you know, of course, not none of us, not bored. You know, none of us are kind of condoning, you know, murder. Oh, of or course arson, not. Right? Yeah, we never, never said that. Nobody in the band has ever said no, anything like that. Yeah. yeah. No. So 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 it, it, so that's one thing. And of course, uh, you can have a personal opinion about you know that act and where you want to take take uh, uh, you know a stand on that or not but mm. as long as i mean but then he's kind of served his time and uh, and the kind of the norwegian 
you know, uh, and Western, general Western, you know, uh, courts are kind of finished with this case. Yes. So he's kind of, he served his sentence and the whole point of that kind of democratic thing. So the rest of society is okay. You know, okay, you did your time. It's it's kind of over. He did and the crime, course, did his time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, and then of course you can always have individual perspectives on whether you agree with that or not. But, but for us, I mean, and on that note, uh, as I said, if, if, you know, it's not politically correct, but uh, if you're very, very concerned about political correctness, maybe Norwegian black metal is not for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it just it fascinates me the way journalists and contributors, bloggers or what have you, bring up matters that happened, you know, uh, 20, 25 years ago or so. It's 25 years ago, if you can believe it now. My God, it makes me feel old. Um, and but the, the, you, can't, you can't blame them in, 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 because obviously, for the, especially for the general public, hmm. you know, of course, they don't this music doesn't resonate with them. But of course, it fascinates them with the drama and and the extremities of things. Yeah, I'm it's glad a, you see it that way. Yeah, that's a good perspective. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. it's, it's like people people are, 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 are consumed with the, I mean, it's uh, it's fascinating, like like Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain's uh, suicide and, and drug abuse, hmm. you know, or, or Jimi Hendrix, since we talked about him, his drug abuse. You know, it, which is it's horrible stuff, but it, it's it's still iconic because it was so extreme. You know, he was not just you know he was not uh, a guy in a suit uh, and a day job. You know, it, it was something just far on the edge, and that's kind of what you know it it kind of adds to the experience. And and it's no denying that that uh, all the <clears throat> all the sensation and all the extremity, were, which actually this was not just people, you know, in makeup, you know, playing extreme music in the Norwegian black metal scene, there were so many things that actually got real. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, the mayhem story. And, yeah, totally. Yeah, it was yeah, very serious. And and for people, you know, kind of adding that energy into this music, you know, obviously it made the experience more, what can I say, authentic. Hmm. You know, so, so you can't really deny and kind of pretend it wasn't like that. But for me, the way I look at it is that if it was, if if people's interests, uh, you know, if that was all it was, you know, it wouldn't last. I th- and I and I think uh, it was. It's been uh, kind of uh, uh, a, a personal victory in in uh, in that. Um, uh, since since often our success has been kind of partly been been given to you know things outside the music you know mm. that attention but it kind of feels at least not as uh, as uh, as, a, as a success but uh, kind of liberating to be able to go on stage in jeans and t-shirt you know <laughs> and just play the entire in, in a nice little clips or the entire anthems to the welcome at dusk yes uh, and and that's that's good enough you know you have 50,000 people singing along as they and do. Having, I've seen the videos yeah yeah, so 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 so, and it doesn't matter if we're dressed up or have makeup. We kind of the music is kind of beyond that, and I I don't think if it was only the imagery and all the all the stories and all that extremity, I don't think we could do uh, have done these anniversaries the way we do, and and uh, people wouldn't have connected to that music that long ago. And I don't think that people, young people these days, that which is another kind of fascinating things to me that people who weren't even born when we did those albums, you know, they actually pick them up now. Yeah, that's incredible, you know, isn't it? When I say 20-year-olds in Emperor but, but, T-shirts, because they wouldn't have known it back then like, like I did. You no, know, I grew but, up but with I it. Think, yeah, but, but obviously it's, uh, again, it's, it's kind of an abstract thing. And, and, and I, I believe that because that, that kind of rebellious, youthful nature that obviously went into, we were teenagers, you know, when we did the first Emperor album. And, uh, and of course, it, we had no clue what we were doing, but the, but the intention and the energy we put into it was something that probably resonated to young people with a similar mindset. And I think people who kind of are drawn, to, young people are drawn to this this type of music 
you know, can th- that useful energy is probably it's kind of part of that recording. And I think in some way that might might resonate with the uh, with them as well because it surprised me because of, obviously we get statements so it kind mm. of surprises me that these old albums just keep on selling it doesn't <laughs> surprise me because of the quality to be frank with you okay the, people are drawn to quality and in the same way that people are purchasing hendrix albums 50 years or 40 or what is it 40 or 50 years after they're recorded yeah, yeah exactly, I, exactly i believe people are going to be doing that in 50 to 60 years time with emperor albums and with your albums quality Quality stays. You know, you look at Mozart or the great ja- the jazz greats, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis. Yeah, yeah. People of all ages, all all religious affiliations, they get into this music, and yours is similar. Yeah, but it's 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 all, all a matter. I think it's so imp- important, and it, it, that kind of kind of concludes, I think, much of the of the of the com- conversation we just just had. It mm-hmm. in the end, you just have to keep focus on on doing things with integrity. Indeed. It's like I I I, I have some some uh, guitar students, and and you know, oh you've been successful. What 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 do, what's the right thing to do? And I say, well, you know what, not nothing is. I mean, there's so many things in life you have to do. You know, playing guitar is not either a human right or, uh, you know, a, a chore. It's something that you do for pleasure, and eventually, if you do it you know extensively you actually hmm. might get so good at it that someone else will take pleasure in it as well and if it if not you had that pleasure and that's keeping focus on the why you started to do music and your intentions because there's so many forces in this game who who start thinking about what is smart to do and what could be more successful and all that and i think you just end up watering out you know Hmm. Your your own pleasure of doing it, as well as uh, as watering out, you know, whatever comes out there for for listeners you have. Hmm. Agreed. Well, mate, I better let you go. This has been a fascinating discussion. It's been a pleasure to finally talk to you. I have been a fan of yours for well since um, Anthems of the Welcome at Dusk. So what's that, ninety seven or so? Um, so yeah. <laughs> thank you for creating the wonderful music that you've created, and congratulations on a wonderful career. And long may you continue to create music as well. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you so much for the support. Well, there he is, ladies and gentlemen. What a fantastic fella, Ishan from Emperor. I enjoyed that conversation a lot, I must say. It's one of the uh, more memorable chats, and that's really saying something across well over 700 conversations at this point with a member of a very prominent black metal outfit, probably the most prominent black metal outfit, in all fairness, I know you've got your mayhems and your immortals, and I love all of that stuff, but Ishan just seems to be cut from very different cloth. Now, if you enjoyed that chat, part two is also available, so search for that on the YouTube channel. Elsewhere, if you want to listen to even more conversations similar to that one there, go across to scarsandguitars.com. Dive into the podcast app there, the link and you'll be taken to a whole new world of conversations with luminaries from black metal, heavy metal, death metal, thrash metal, all of the different types of metal, rock and beyond. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading too. I've written a book about it all. Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond. Click the link in the banner on the website. You'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice download a sample and if you do complete the purchase because you enjoy what you read in the sample please do hit me up because I want to thank you personally I've got some more to say about the book in the moment but before I do I want to bid you a fond farewell my name's Andrew Mackay Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast until next time it is a very goodbye for now this is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse you are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay Smith I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary 
such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the... I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, I just I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.